Hi, welcome back to this my fourth data update for 2021. And when I mention the topic for this update, you're probably going to shut this session down and move on because it's going to sound boring. It's hurdle rates. You're saying, who cares about hurdle rates? Hurdle rates are central to running a business, small or large, public or private. A hurdle rate is a rate of return you need to make on an investment for it to pass muster. In other words, if you're trying to decide whether to take a project, whether to do an acquisition, the way you make that judgment is to look to see whether the return you make on that investment exceeds a hurdle rate. If it's that central, you'd think that we'd all have some consensus on what it is, right? But you'd be wrong, because there's a lot of confusion about what a hurdle rate is. There are some people out there who believe that a hurdle rate should reflect the cost of raising capital, that if you've raised capital at 9%, that that'll become your hurdle rate. There are others who think of it as an opportunity cost, what you can make on an investment out there of equivalent risk. And the third group of people believe that it should reflect your history. In other words, if you have a history of making 20% returns, your hurdle rate should be set at 20%. In a sense, there is some truth to each of the, those definitions, but each one has its weaknesses. So I'm gonna thread the needle using all three definitions. I'm gonna start by looking at the role hurdle rates play in a business and look at how different factors play out in the hurdle rate. So let's start with the first definition of a hurdle rate, that it's a cost of funding. If you run any business, there are only two ways you can raise money or capital for that business. You can use your own money, which we call equity, or you can borrow the money, which is debt. Now, of course, as you get bigger and more established as a company, that equity might take the form of shares issued to the market, and your debt might take the form of bonds, but it never changes its debt and equity. Your cost of raising capital should therefore reflect the cost of raising equity and the cost of raising debt. Now, I'm not going to delve into risk and return models and take you deep into modern portfolio theory. I'm going to give you the intuition. Your cost of equity is the rate of return that investors in your equity demand when they invest in your, in, in your company. Now, after all, they have some perception of the risk in your equity, and they're saying, based on the risk, I need to make 11, 12, 9, Whatever percentage rate of return they demand is your cost of equity. What's the cost of debt? It's the rate at which you can borrow money today. And that rate will reflect your credit risk as a company. Lenders will take that into account. And the more credit risk they see, the higher the cost of borrowing. There's one added factor, which is the tax code is tilted in favor of debt. In what sense? Interest expenses are tax deductible. That effectively lowers the cost of debt so that after-tax cost of debt becomes the cost you consider. Now, your overall rate, cost of raising capital will be a weighted average of those two numbers. Your cost of equity weighted by the proportion of your capital that comes from equity, and your cost of debt weighted by the proportion of your capital that comes from debt. So if you use this approach, you can come up with a cost of capital for a company, and many companies do, and they use that cost of capital as a hurdle rate for every project that they look at. In my view, that's an extremely dangerous thing to do for a simple reason. Unless you're a very unusual company where every project you look at is identical. And I'll give you an example. You're a retailer and every investment you look at is another store in a mall. This approach is not going to work for you. And here's why. Let's say you're in three different businesses with different risks. And you apply one corporate hurdle rate because they're all part of the same company. The riskier businesses that you, that you have will end up with too low a hurdle rate and will take too many projects, and your safer businesses will be charged too high a hurdle rate and not take enough. In effect, here's what you're doing. You're starving your safe businesses and subsidizing your risky businesses. You've seen big companies come apart because of this mistake. Here's a second definition of a hurdle rate. It's an opportunity cost. Well, people often make that statement, but they forget to qualify it. Here's what I mean. It is true a hurdle rate is an opportunity cost, but that opportunity cost is the return you can make on an investment of equivalent risk. That's key, equivalent risk. In other words, if you're looking at a project which is with guaranteed cash flows, your hurdle rate could be the risk-free rate. If you take a project with a lot of very risky cash flows, your hurdle rate will reflect the return you can make on investment of high risk. That effectively means that if you're a multi-business company, your hurdle rate should vary across businesses, maybe even vary across projects. 
What do you gain by doing this? You no longer have that subsidization where safe projects are paying for risky projects. And you should also be careful that when you compute hurdle rates for projects, you don't give an individual project the benefit of how much debt it takes on because often that debt is accidental. Some projects get funded with equity, others with debt. You're trying as best as you can to make the project stand on its own two feet. So hurdle rate is an opportunity cost, gives you the return you need to make on the investment. Now, we're not going to go delve into how we measure the actual returns, but broadly speaking, you can trust the accountants and using, using a, use an accounting return on the project, return in equity or return on capital. Or you can go with cash flows and even time weight the cash flows. But the end game here is you want to take investments that make more than that opportunity cost. There's a third definition of a hurdle rate that some companies adopt. And it comes from a very simple reason. When I describe the opportunity cost as the rate of return you need to make on an investment of equivalent risk, implicitly I was also saying that if you can make more than that return, this project is a good project and you should take it. You're saying, what's wrong with that statement? Well, it depends on whether you have the capital to be able to take that, right? Let's say you're a small company with capital constraints. What are capital constraints? You can't go out and raise as much capital as you want. Those constraints can either come from the outside because you don't have access to markets or your transactions costs of raising capital are high, or they can be internal constraints where a company is unwilling to raise fresh equity because the existing owners don't want to dilute their ownership and refuses to borrow money because they have an aversion to debt. For whatever reason, if you have limited capital and lots of projects, you cannot take every project that earns more than its opportunity cost. So here's what you do. You take a subset of projects and you do it sensibly. Let's say you have 50 projects and let's say they're all of equivalent risk and the opportunity cost given that risk is 10% and all 50 projects make more than 10%. In a world without constraints, you take all 50, right? But you have constraints, so here's what you will do. You will take the 50 projects, rank them from highest to lowest, and start moving down the list. Until when? Until you run out of capital. Let's say you run out of capital after the 22nd project. That 22nd project is probably still making 18 or 20%. Let's say it's making 20%, but you have to stop because you have no more capital. You know what you do? You raise your hurdle rate to 20% because it clears the capital. That, may, that sounds sensible. It might in the year that you do it, but here's the problem. Once you set that hurdle rate, a force takes over. It's called inertia. You know what inertia is? Companies often do what they do because that's what they've always done. Once you set that hurdle rate at 20%, it takes on a life of its own. And here's what you will see the company doing. Continuing to use the 20% hurdle rate long after the capital rationing constraints are gone. So 30 years later, you're a mature company with hardly any projects, you're still demanding a 20% hurdle rate. That's no way to run a business. So if you look at the three ways of defining hurdle rates, the cost of raising funding and opportunity costs or reflecting your history, the second approach is not just the, 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 the best reason, but it's also the most flexible. So let's say I've convinced you in the second approach and say, okay, your, your hurdle rate should reflect the opportunity cost of investing in something of equivalent risk, what are the factors that drive that equivalent risk? I'm going to argue that there are three factors with a fourth thrown in for good measure. The first is what business your investment is in. Is it a risky business or a safe business? Predictable or unpredictable? The second is geography. What part of the world are you building your factories and where do you plan to sell your products and services? Some parts of the world are riskier than others. The third is what currency you're doing the analysis in. And of course, the fourth factor, which is kind of an untold factor, is your hurdle rate will change over time. Why? Because markets shift over time. The price of risk changes over time. If you follow that reasoning, your hurdle rate will be dynamic. It will change across projects and change across time. So let's take each of those factors. Let's start with the business. Let's start with each of these. I'll start with a basic, I think, intuitive proposition. Let's say you're a company in two businesses. One is predictable revenues and stable margins. The other is cyclical revenues and volatile margins. I would expect the second business to have a higher hurdle rate than the first one. Now, having said that, though, there are two tricky components to business risk we've got to deal with. 
The first is, when you look at any company, small or large, you find that the risk in that company comes from two components. One is risk specific to the company, things that it does well or does badly that could affect its future. Let me give you an example. When you invest in Apple, one of your worries is, will the next Apple iPhone do better or worse than expected? That is risk specific to the company. In what sense? If they do well, Apple will, you know, will earn higher profits. If they do badly, Apple will have a bad year, but the rest of the world will move on. The second type of risk is macro or market-wide risk. What's in there? Well, how well any company does, especially in today's market, will depend on how quickly this economy comes out of the shutdown. What will happen to interest rates in the future? Will inflation come back? Those are macro risks. Saying, why waste your time dividing risks up? If you put all your money in Apple, you're exposed to all of those risks, right? You can't avoid either of them. But let's say you spread your bets. You have 15, 20, 25 companies in your portfolio. Here's what's going to happen. It's almost magical. The risk that is company specific would start to average out. In what sense? For every company that does something less well than you expect it to do, there'll be another company that does better than expected. The essence of company specific risk is leverage out across your portfolio. Macro risk, you could have 2,500 stocks in your portfolio, you're still going to be exposed to higher inflation. You're still saying, so what? If you ask me, which of these risks should I be building into my hurdle rate? My answer is going to, is going to be based on who the investors in your company are. If the marginal investors, the big investors in your company you trade a lot, are big institutional investors with diversified portfolios, 50, 60, 70 stocks in their portfolio, the only risk you should be building into your hurdle rate should be macro or market-wide risk. This is not some modern portfolio theory concoction. It's just common sense. If you are the private owner of a small business and your entire wealth is started in that business, well, guess what? Your hurdle rate should reflect all risks because you can't diversify away any of that risk. The second factor that could affect your business risk is how much leverage you bring into the game. And there's a lot of misconceptions about debt. But let's start with the truth. Lenders get first and contractual claims on the cash flows. Equity investors are always last in line. So what? Well, for most companies, almost every company, the cost of debt will be lower than the cost of equity. Having said that, though, let me add another feature that makes the debt even cheaper, which is the tax subsidy. That makes the cost of debt even lower. So the cost of debt is much lower than the cost of equity. Already I can see your brain saying, well, that must mean that if I add debt, my hurdle rate must go down. Well, not necessarily. In fact, debt brings good and bad into your hurdle rate. The good is it brings in the tax benefit. The bad is it can make your company potentially face a greater chance of distress, failure. The net effect is what drives the hurdle rate. For some companies, increasing debt will lower the hurdle rate, but that entire increase is coming, not from the fact that debt is cheaper than equity, but from the tax subsidy. For other companies, adding debt will raise the hurdle rate because the distress factor overwhelms the tax advantage. That's the first step. Now, if you want to see this play out, one way you can see this is by looking at how costs of capital vary across businesses. And I made an attempt here. I took every publicly traded company in the world, 45,000 plus companies, broke them down by sector. These are the S&P sectors. And computed the cost of capital for each sector. Take a look at the median. Real estate and utilities have really low cost of capital. Consumer discretionary and technology have among the highest cost of capital. Costs of capital vary across businesses. So if you happen to be a company that has a real estate division, and a consumer discretionary division. You can't be using one hurdle rate for both. They're very different businesses. Let's move on to geography. And again, let me start with a basic and I think intuitive proposition. Let's say you're a company that's looking at, a, a, at two projects. They're equivalent, pretty much the same project, but one is going to be in Nigeria and the other is going to be in Germany. And you're computing both hurdle rates in US dollars, so currency is not a factor. On which of these projects would you demand a higher hurdle rate? I know which one I would. I would demand a higher hurdle rate on the Nigerian project. Now, you might get some pushback on that, though. There are people who argue 
that country risk doesn't matter because it can be diversified away because if you're in 50 countries, things average out just like they did with stocks. Well, that might have been true 40 years ago, but it's not true anymore. So the question is, how do we bring country risk into the hurdle rate? And the vehicle I use is the equity risk premium. If you remember a couple of sessions ago, I talked about the equity risk premiums, the price of risk in equity markets. And I computed an equity risk premium for the US, a forward-looking premium of 4.72% at the start of 2021. That is the equity risk premium I demand if my project were an entirely US project. Now, if I could somehow take that 4.72% and come up with a way of estimating equity risk premiums in Nigeria or Bangladesh, I should be able to come up with a hurdle rate that incorporates country risk. And it's not rocket science. I do this twice every year, and here's how I build up to it. I start with the S&P 500, not because I'm parochial, but because the inputs to get an implied premium are far easier to get with the S&P 500 than any other index. That gave me the 4.72% at the start of 2021. I then divide the world up into mature markets and not mature markets. I wouldn't call them immature, that sounds insulting, but not mature markets. And this is very simplistic. The way I do this is if you're a AAA rated country, Germany, the Netherlands, Australia, Canada, Singapore, I give you the same premium as the US, arguing that mature markets share the same premium. If you're not a mature market, and my definition of not a mature market is your rating is below AAA, I take your sovereign rating and I come up with a default spread based on the rating. Remember, the lower your rating, the larger that spread. And I make one final stop. This is the spread for buying a government bond issued by that country. But I'm interested in buying equities. Equities are riskier than bonds. And I compute, on average, how much riskier by looking at the standard deviation of an emerging market equity index that S&P maintains relative to an emerging market government bond index. That ratio is 1.1. So what does that tell me? Well, it basically means equities are 1.1 times more risky than bonds. So if I'm charging a 2% default spread for buying a bond, I'd be charging 1.1 times 2%, 2.2% as my country risk premium. I'm almost home. You add that on to the 4.72%, you come up with an equity risk premium for that country. So here's what the world looked like to me at the start of 2021. Now, I, I've done one miscategorization. I apologize. I put Mauritius in Asia. It's really in Africa, so I'll move it one of these days. But you can see the breakdown of the world, and you can see three columns. So let's take Asia. Let's take Bangladesh. It's rated BA3 by Moody's. So it's a pretty risky country. The country risk premium, the added risk premium adding for Bangladesh is 3.49%. That comes from the default spread multiplied by 1.1. You add the 3.49% to 4.72%, which is the US premium. You have the risk premium for Bangladesh. And you can see equity risk premiums varying across the world. Now, I might say, how am I going to use this? Remember that starting example where a company was looking at a project in Germany and a project in Nigeria? Let's say you're doing both in US dollars. The risk free rate in US dollars is 1%. That's my starting point for both hurdle rate calculations. Let's say for simplicity that this project is, um, is a slightly above average risk project. Let's give it a beta 1.1 or basically we're saying this project is 1.1 times more risky than the average risk project. If I were looking at a US project, I'd take 1%, which is my risk free rate, plus 1.1 times 4.72%, my US premium. That'd give me a cost of equity a for, for the US of about 6%. If I did the same thing for the project in Nigeria, same risk free rate, same beta, but I'd replace the 4.72% with the Nigerian equity risk premium, which is 10.05%. That's going to give me a cost of equity in US dollar terms of 12%. In US dollar terms, you can already see that where your project is invested can give you very different cost of equity. So we looked at business, we've looked at geography, Let's fill in the last detail. I've done all of my talking in US dollar terms, and that might have struck you as avoidance. You're saying, what about other currencies? Well, you know what? Currencies should not change your fundamentals. Currencies are just a scaling mechanism. 
the analogy I give is if you live in a really hot part of the world and I give you your temperature in Celsius, that temperature looks lower than the temperature in Fahrenheit, but it's still the same temperature. The same, same thing applies with currencies. That Nigerian project that I just described with a beta 1.1, my cost of equity in US dollar terms was 12.06%. And here's the truth about currencies. What currencies bring to the calculation is different inflation rates. That's it. By using a different currency, I can make a risky project into a safe project or a safe project into a risky project. So I'll get specific. Let's assume the expected inflation rate in the US dollar is 1% and the expected inflation rate in the Nigerian Naira is 8%. Remember the cost of equity in US dollars was 12.06%. Here's the shortcut. You could take the 12.06 and take the differential inflation, which is 7%, and you get 19.06% as your Nigerian Naira cost of equity. Now it's an approximation because inflation compounds. And what I mean by that is everything gets adjusted by inflation. Your risk premium goes up, your risk free rate goes up, so the more precise calculation, here's what you do. You take the 12.06%, you convert to a decimal, 1.1206, and then you take the inflation and you also convert into ratio, 1.08, which is the Nigerian inflation divided by 1.01. You net out one, you come up with the Naira cost of equity of 19.83%. So you can see that with the more precise calculation, my Naira hurdle rate will be 7.77% higher than my dollar hurdle rate. Now one way to see how currencies play out is to look at risk-free rates in currencies because that difference in inflation shows up in the risk-free rates. At the start of every year, I compute risk-free rates in about 40 currencies where I can find a government bond. So I'll give you an example of how this works out. The government bond rate in each of these currencies is not necessarily the risk-free rate. Why? Because some governments have default risk in them. So let's suppose you wanted to get a risk-free rate in Colombian pesos. At the start of 2021, the 10-year government bond rate in pesos was 4.95%. But based on Colombia's rating, the default spread was 1.68%. In other words, 1.68 of the 4.95% that you get for the bond is for default. You net out the default spread. The risk-free rate in Colombian pesos is 3.27%. And I do this for every currency where I could find a government bond. Notice that risk-free rates, even after I've cleaned up for the default rate, are, are different for different currencies. Why? Because inflation is different. And there are some currencies where the risk-free rate is negative. A phenomenon that freaks people out, but as I've written before on it, it's unusual but not unnatural. We have to learn to live with negative risk-free rates in euros, in yen, in Swiss francs. It's okay. You can still do your analysis building off a negative number. So what are the implications of all of this talk? First, when you talk about hurdle rates, get currency nailed down. And here's why it's so critical. Each of us has a frame of reference, which is we're used to whatever currency we work with a lot. So for me, because I work a lot with US dollars, when I tend to talk about something, I tend to think in terms of dollars. And because I assume that everybody else I'm talking to has the same frame of reference, I'm not explicit about it. We can no longer do that. If you're discussing a cost of capital with somebody else, whether it's high or low, before you get too deep in the discussion, you've got to first be explicit about what currency you're using. Because currencies matter. I mean, put simply, 6% cost of capital looks lower than a 12% cost of capital. But a 6% hurdle rate in euros may actually be higher than a 12% hurdle rate in Turkish lira after inflation is considered. And I've heard people talk about global risk-free rates. That's nonsense. There is no global risk-free rate. Risk-free rates go with currencies. In fact, you can even take inflation entirely out of the process called a real analysis, in which case currency cease to matter completely. Nailed down currency. Second, we live in a low hurdle rate world especially if you think in US dollars and euros, but in every currency, look at where we are today relative to where that currency used to be 20 years ago. We're looking at lower hurdle rates than we've ever seen. How low? Well, one very simple way to see this is to look at the cost of capital 
in US dollars across companies. Now, if you look at this cost of capital graph, you will notice that the median cost of capital is low in both, in, uh, both for global and US companies. It's really low. In fact, take a look at this graph because I'm going to bring in a table that's going to enrich this graph. So you ready? Here's the table. So if you look to the right, I now have the distribution of cost of capital in much of the world. Let's say global companies. The median cost of capital in US dollars for a global company is 5.78%. The median cost of capital for a US company is 5.3%. And that's in US dollars. In fact, if I did this in euros, the median would look even lower. Now, part of you is screaming, that's way too low. And the older you are, the lower it will look. Because let's face it, the cost of capital we got used to when we first got started tend to be the numbers we think of as normal. So if you're 60 years old, you're used to 10, 12, 14% cost of capital. And there is an interesting follow-up to this. Remember I said inertia is the strongest force in business, that people tend to do what they've always done. There are companies out there who have costs of capital that reflect their history. They used to demand 15% be able to earn it. And they're still sticking with those costs of capital, but the world has shifted under them. I talk to value investors say, I will never invest in stocks if I don't make double digit returns. As if you're guaranteed a double digit return, well, that might have been okay 10, 20, 30 years ago. But in the world we're in, if you demand double digit returns, you're gonna end up with an almost all cash portfolio. We have to live in the world we're in, not the world we wished we were in. Now, you can build some buffer for what you think might be higher inflation in the future. But even with that buffer, you can't, there's no way you're going to get from 5.3 to 15%. Final factor, and this is going to come as a surprise, because I do spend a lot of time talking about valuation. And in my valuation classes, we do spend time on risk-free rates, risk premiums, the architecture of discount rates. But I'm going to say something that's going to surprise you. I think we spend far too much time when we do discounted cash flow valuation coming up with discount rates and too little time on cash flows. I see bankers spending 80%, 85% of the time in evaluation coming up with discount rates. And that makes no sense to me. If we go back and look at the previous page, look at the distribution of the cost of capital. In fact, 50% of all U.S. companies have cost of capital between 4.2 and 5.7%. 50% of companies. 80% of companies have cost of capital between 3.5 and 6.3%. So I'm going to make a suggestion, and it's going to sound sacrilegious. You're sitting down to value a U.S. company. You're in a hurry. Here's what I suggest you do. Go to the distribution. If it's a safe company, use 4.16%. That's the 25th percentile. If it's an average risk company, use 5.3%. Risky company, use 5.7% as your cost of capital. Spend your time estimating cash flows, growth, margins, reinvestment, the key stuff, the big stuff. And if you have time, come back and finish the discount rate, if you have time. I know the pushback I will get is you've seen sensitivity analysis that shows what will happen to the value if you hold everything else constant and change just the discount rate. Don't believe those analyses. And here's the reason. When you change the discount rate, everything else changes. Or put differently, if you wake up tomorrow in a world where risk-free rates are 4% and the cost of capital is 8%, do you really think your earnings and cash flows are going to look like they did today? Of course, your value is going to change a lot if just discount rates change. But when discount rates change, cash flows change, growth rates change, that's what I mean about not expending too much of your time and resources overthinking discount rates. I hope this session has been useful, and thank you for listening.